What did we learn? Doing wrong is like a joke to who? To a fool. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 464. Today, I'm joined by Sensei Jenny Siu. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, and I'm a guy who thinks the world of martial arts. And that's why we bring all of our martial arts content to the world. And if you want to see everything we've got going on, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for every single episode of this show. But wait, there's more. Go to whistlekick.com. And you can see all the other stuff that we're doing because Whistlekick is a lot more than this show. We've got a store over there. If you make a purchase, use the code PODCAST15. That'll save you 15%. And it helps us know that this show leads to sales, which means we can justify putting the money in. We're bringing you this show twice a week. On Mondays, we bring you an interview like today. On Thursdays, we bring you some kind of a topic show. Sometimes it's just me. Sometimes I bring a guest on. And the entire goal of the show is to connect, educate, inspire martial artists from around the world. And if you want to help contribute to that mission, there are a lot of ways you can help, whether it's making a purchase or sharing an episode, or if you join our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And yeah, there's links from our websites to get there. We have more content, more stuff for you that's only for people who contribute. Let's talk about the guest. Typically, when someone comes on the show, I know nothing more than their name. Once in a while, we have a guest who I know of, maybe because of things that they've done in the martial arts world, or maybe it's a friend of mine. Well, today's guest sits in a few different spaces. I've known who Sensei Siu is because of her relationship to her husband and his relationship to Whistlekick. But she and I had never talked before, at least before this episode. So it was a lot of fun to finally have a conversation with this person that I knew of but did not know. And I think it was a really good conversation. We talked about faith and fate. And of course, we talked about her husband. We talked about Whistlekick. We talked about a lot of things. And I had a great time with it. I hope you do as well. So let's welcome her to the show. How are you? Doing well. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. It's great to uh, finally meet you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking that. I was like, huh. I don't think we've ever spoken. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> it's awesome it is awesome oh. i appreciate your time yeah um i was just gonna tell you i uh i'm home alone with my three kiddos they should sleep through this whole thing but just a heads okay. up i i told them they can all watch a movie and eat cookies <laughs> until I wow <laughs> if they come if they come in here i'll i'll shoo them back out they're awesome but uh, yeah that would be the if we've only... got to edit that no big deal yeah that would be the only chance of an interruption but they're pretty amazing so but I'm a little biased, you know, so, <laughs> yes. as you should be, as yes. you should be. If you're not, then, uh, right. Then I think that might say something. Indeed. So how are you doing? I'm great. Awesome. I'm great. Busy as hell, but yeah. Great. Hey, that's a good thing. It sure is. <laughs> we yeah. are as well. seems like there's a uh... good. Yeah. Yeah. I know. We were just talking but... about that. I have to schedule downtime, man. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've been I've been getting better. I um I've been aiming for Fridays. Like I try to knock off early on Fridays, which nice. has been huge. Nice. Because what it means is I get stuff done faster. I am the worst in the world at, at tasks expanding to the time available. Uh-huh. <laughs> so there are days I look at my schedule and I'm like, this is like half days worth of work. Eleven hours later. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Going, no, I hear you. You know, you could have been a lot more efficient, Jeremy. <laughs> well, I know. I know. That's uh that's life. That's absolutely life. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It really is. And that's okay. Yeah. Okay. It gets better. Yes. That's good. You know how this goes. I think so. Listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I want to do? I just want to roll into it if you're okay with that. Sounds good. Because we're just, we're just chatting. All right. And uh, I think a lot of the listeners appreciate when we do these episodes. Awesome. I will. I'm, I'm quite honored <laughs> after listening to some of the episodes. I definitely don't feel like I stand up there with, uh, with some of the others, but you know what? Well, I don't either. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and as I say that, I think to myself, but you know what? I am passionate about this and, um, and I'm doing it and I'm loving it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and that's, isn't that the important part though? It is. It's, it's what I love about martial arts is we all have that, that 
different relationship with it. You know, it's more alike than it is different, but we focus in on the differences. It, and and that can be good because it allows us to find where where we are. And it, it drives me nuts when people, you know, they look at what someone else does in the martial arts. It's literally changing their life or in some cases has saved their life. And mm-hmm. they criticize it and say, what you're doing isn't martial arts. Yep. And it makes me want to strangle them. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's let's do that first question thing that we got to do about about you and how you got started. Okay, sounds good. So I got started. Um, to be absolutely honest, being a little kid, and uh, I was the only girl in our entire neighborhood. And uh, what that meant was, all of the guys that I played with, you know, I'm talking five, six, seven years old. They were awesome kids. They were safe, um, and so that was a huge blessing. Um, but it was a big group of guys that just loved to wrestle and play war and watch Chuck Norris and, um, MacGyver. And that was, you know, I was my mom's little princess who she kind of planned was going to, you know, do ballet and all that stuff. And I ran around with the guys and had a blast and all of us, uh, we always talked about martial arts. Um, I think to be fair, we always talked about karate because we didn't know um anything else any other words i should say um but none of us ever had formal training or anything like that there was that that was at that time our perception was that was for the rich kids and we couldn't afford to go take classes so we'd just play and pretend um but it was always a dream um my family didn't have a lot of money so if you fast forward to when i was 12 so I'd had this dream my whole life, but it was really never more than that. I knew it just was too expensive to become a reality for us. Um, but when I was 12, Christmas Day, my aunt, who is practically a best friend more than an aunt, um, she had seen a, a sign for an introductory karate class at her uh, health club that she attended and worked out at. And she thought that'd be a really cool Christmas present. And uh, so she asked my parents and uh, we ended up attending that together, she and I. And that was my very first introduction to martial arts. It was a 12-week course in Shitoru. I had no clue what different styles of martial arts were at all. I just knew I got, I finally got to do karate. And I was, man, I was eating it up. I was absolutely loving it. And uh so that's really how I got introduced and started. Um, she was pretty amazing because not only did that fulfill a huge dream for me, but actually um, God is kind because she did something kind for me and she ended up meeting her future husband in that class. And so uh, after, a, after a few weeks, they would drop me off for karate and they'd go out on dates and uh, they were married about six months later, which was really fantastic. He's an amazing guy. Um, but that was my introduction to it. And at the end of that 12 week course, um, I was accepted to join their club there that met there. Um, but it was really expensive again, same kind of same problem. And, uh, and also my my family is Christian. My parents were pretty, uh, pretty conservative Christians. And one of the things that they were not comfortable with was some of the some of the Eastern practices, uh, meditation and such, um, just not understanding those, not wanting to be a part of those. And, uh, especially for their 12 year old kid, you know? And so, um, I was pretty, pretty discouraged that I finally got to do karate and then I didn't get to continue. Um, but I do believe that, uh, that was, again, that was totally God's plan because he had something better. And you can't see that when you're 12 and disappointed, you know. But uh, fast forward a few months, uh, finished that course up um, somewhere around May. Um, and in August, I found another martial arts school that was significantly cheaper and uh, called them, talked to them, and ended up starting to attend there. Um, it was in August when I was 12, almost 13. And I ended up joining that school and I continued there until they closed when I was 17. 
and it was it was amazing um i learned so much um there was an interesting dynamic going on when i first got there that i had no idea about um well, what had happened was my my sensei the owner of the school um his daughter had died uh, about uh, two weeks before I started attending there and I had no idea um, and obviously he just couldn't bring himself to come to the dojo and teach classes for months and so his friends uh, all around in the martial arts community were amazing guys and they jumped in to keep his school alive and so I started right at this point and I really didn't understand <laughs> what in the world was going on but it was really fascinating because just about mm, just about every different class was taught by a, a different sensei and they all taught a little differently and they all had a little different uniform on they had a little different program um and so i was a, i was confused i didn't exactly get uh i didn't exactly move up in the syllabus so anyways i had this really really interesting um situation that i had walked into and i had no idea and uh long term it was awesome because i got perspectives from different martial arts instructors all over um all at once you know one guy was really focused on um on sparring another guy was really focused on your stances in kata you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and i was just starting out and i was eating it all up um but I never met the owner of the school until I was actually already a blue belt in his system. Um, so just kind of an, I, I, I think that's a unique start to your martial arts training. Um, and I think it was one that definitely gave me a, an interesting perspective. Um, and one of the amazing things about that school was a guy that I have to say, I, I gotta I gotta talk about him. His name was Harry, and he was he was sixteen. Uh, he was a green belt, which was just below the uh, the black belt ranks, the uh, red red brown and black ranks in that style. Um, and uh, he was only sixteen, but he was there every single day. If no black belts showed up, he ran classes. He did his very best. He trained like crazy just so that he could keep that school going he could keep it running um he was definitely the backbone of that school uh during that time period um and really all throughout my time there um he was only a few years older than me and he wasn't a black belt but when people ask me who was your sensei that's who i consider my sensei because he invested so much he went he would go in his off time and he'd go to other schools and he'd say, Hey, I haven't learned about this. Can I put on a white belt? Can you just throw me around and show me some stuff? Can I just sit, sit and watch? I just want to learn. Um, I don't have a lot of money, but if you want me to pay you, I'll, I'll try. And, uh, and people were, it was fascinating because, um, he would find some people who were very receptive and say, come on in, we'll take you under our wing, we'll teach you what we know, you teach us what you know, it'll be great. And he had other people say, are you kidding me? Go back to your own school, do your own thing. And so he would come back and he would kind of debrief those experiences. And uh, it definitely rounded out my training. And so I, I attribute a lot of what I learned um, definitely to him. So. That was, that was my start. My sensei did come back. He is an amazing guy. He was an amazing martial artist. Um, obviously, he had a rough year uh, that year. And um, so I did not get very close to him um, because I was very close to the same age as his daughter. And I think, he, I, I think that was an element where he just distanced himself from a lot of us who had started at that period in time. But he came around uh, as he was able. And he was a fantastic instructor. And so I, I was very, very blessed to be able to grow up there. So, wow. yeah. That's quite the beginning. It is. It is. <laughs> I'm very, very uh, thankful. So. Yeah. And 
what's interesting in that story is I see so many places where it could have gone sideways. Oh, absolutely. So do I, especially in retrospect. Yeah. And what's blowing my mind is, is the, I think if we were to try to put Vegas odds on it, the likelihood that you would have persisted through and, and speak to me now are, are just so minuscule. You know, most people who start martial arts don't continue. You know, we, we, we kick around these numbers, you know, one in a hundred or whatever it is right. ever earn a black belt. You know, we know it's a small percentage, but that's encompassing everyone who has, you know, including supportive parents and instructors who don't lose their children and, and yeah. all and all of these things. And I'm just it it's almost like one after another. It's like, bam, bam, bam. How how your martial arts upbringing took all these hits and you just kept going through. And it, it it's almost I mean, you're clearly a person of faith. It's almost like it would it was fate. Yeah, it had to happen. Yeah. And, you know, I know a little bit of your story because, you know, we'll, I'll probably mention something in this in the intro, you know, because of our, our connection and, and yeah. the conversations I've had with your husband. Right. But it seems like this was part of your path from day one. Absolutely. And I believe that. Of course, I believe that. Um, and of course, as my story continues, um, you know, I personally can see exactly why all this happened. Uh, I couldn't see it then. Um, and that was okay for then. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the other aspects that just blows my mind is we didn't have extra money for extra things. But I had um, truly incredible supportive parents who loved us so well and uh, have a younger sister. and they they were so supportive that uh you know when i when i came to them and i said hey i found this school that costs literally half of what everyone else is charging i know because i called them all um as a 12 year old i pulled out the yellow pages and called everybody um but uh i said this this school is charging you know literally half of what everyone else is charging it's not that far away um and uh this is something I'd really like to do. Is there a way we can make this work? And my mom's response was, well, I can teach some piano lessons and then we can use that money to pay for karate. And uh, I just found that incredible. Like her willingness to just instantly just sacrifice, just say, you know what? I can give up time. I can make that happen for you. Um, and then, you know, there, I know now as a, as a teacher that there are not as many supportive parents out there as there should be. Um, and that's, you know, that's one of my passions is that kids get the support that they need. Um, because I look back and I think to myself, when I was going through my first forms as a white and yellow belt and stumbling around in our backyard or our living room, my parents didn't know martial arts. They didn't know anything about it, but constantly they were, hey, that looks good. Ooh, I think I can tell it looks better than it did last week. Have you been working on that? I don't know what I'm talking about, but man, you're looking sharper and sharper. You know, just little things like that. I remember them 30 years later, you know, <laughs> and uh, it was pretty incredible. So I was very, very blessed that, uh, you know, they said, hey, this is something you're passionate about. We're going to make sure even if you've got to compromise and hang out at the library for a few hours to make it to class, like we'll make sure we drive you out there four days a week. And uh, it was pretty amazing. Wow. So, now you brought up earlier the challenge that they had with some of the Eastern traditions that most of us in martial arts are, are very familiar with and mm -hmm. don't view in a religious aspect, but outside of martial arts, they're, they're at least religion adjacent, if not religious practices. Right. How, how did you work through that? Because it's a, that's a subject that I'm seeing come up more and more mm -hmm. in martial arts groups that I'm part of. What was that conversation like? So that was a fascinating conversation. It's one that continued for years, obviously, um, being, especially the, the longer I was in martial arts, the more exposed I was to, um, to more of those things. And the more I studied, the more I learned. Um, at, the, at the core, um, you know, at the very beginning, this school that I began to attend uh, claimed to teach from a Christian point of view. Uh, that was another one of the things that was encouraging. 
uh, to our family. It, in fairness, it was in the name, and that was about it. There weren't any Christian values being taught in that, in, in the sense that they didn't really bring up the Bible, they didn't really talk about God. It was just void of those things that were concerning to Christians, if that makes sense. Um, and so they just kind of took out what they didn't need and kept what they wanted and, um, and didn't really explain anything or talk about it. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't think that was wrong of them. Um, but personally, I wanted to go there and ask those questions. And I'm glad you asked that question. Um, you know, I have recently read of people who they want to do martial arts, but they are not comfortable with bowing. Um, we have had families come to us and say, hey, we're interested in your program, but why do you guys bow? You know, and why do you guys show reverence to each other like that? Uh, isn't bowing a religious practice? Isn't that supposed to be for God or for worship? Um, and so really looking into um, and studying the origins of that and the meaning behind them. And I know many out there understand a lot more than I do, but I, you know, I have studied and I am, you know, a lot of people will say the meditation thing. Um, a lot of people sit in seiza. A lot of people spend a lot of time uh, meditating, clearing their mind. Uh, and as a, as a Christian, you have to ask the question, okay, is that right? Is it wrong? Is it okay? Is it neutral? Is it a part of a, another religion? Um, and it can be. Um, it can be all of those things. Uh, you know, some, some people say, well, I just sit there and pray. I talk to God. Um, but, uh, you know, for, for me personally, I, I, I don't meditate. I haven't seen the need or the value. I do pray a lot, um, you know, but, uh, but that's something that, um, I don't personally do. I haven't needed to. Um, and I, I don't have that as a part of my curriculum in my school right now. Um, but we do, we do bow, um, you know, and we explain it. There's a lot of different ways to discuss and explain uh, that practice. There are people who see it as an act of worship. Um, and in some religions it is. And you know, we say, well, again, where, where, does, where, does martial arts, where does the martial art that we're studying come from? And what did it mean to the people who started doing it? Um, and that's really the question that we like to ask about everything. Um, and, uh, you know, I have, I've kind of just wrestled with what am I comfortable with? Because, you know, as a, as a Christian, I'm a Christian first. And then I'm a martial artist, but they aren't, uh, in my experience, they're not at all mutually exclusive. So um, I don't know if that answers your question in enough detail. It does. It does. Okay. You know, and, and I think longtime listeners know that I'm a free market guy. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I believe you should be able to, to, you know, take whatever you want, take your martial arts and, and expand it and open it. And if you want to, put a, a religious tone on it. I mean, mm. I, I've, I've talked to, and we've had a number of martial artists on this show who are devout in their faith, whatever that faith may be. Mm -hmm. And some of them will create a really strong barrier between the faith and the martial practice. And some say, that's not what I want to do. I want to blend them in fact. Mm -hmm. And what I think is great about that is it attracts other people who are interested in that. And it would be one thing if there was only one place to study martial arts. If we had one school that somehow had a monopoly over martial arts practice, then, then maybe we would have to have a conversation about that. But we don't have to, mm -hmm. because that isn't the case. And if someone's faith enhances their martial arts practice, and their martial arts practice enhances their faith, awesome. Yeah. I mean, what's wrong with that? Now, it may not be the particular type of training that, that someone wants to do, that's fine. You have other options. 
Right. But what I, I love about what you're talking about is that faith is important to you and your martial arts is woven through that. And I think whatever is important to us, finding a way to weave martial arts into that is important. Absolutely. And I think it enhances our understanding. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking that. That's a, that's a great course, question. Of course. It's a question that a lot of people shy away from, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I, I'll, I mean, just based on, on numbers, I'll, I'll guarantee that the first time you mentioned that you were a Christian, somebody turned off the show. That's fine. That's their problem. Because we don't have to agree and follow the same practices to find value. Right. One of the early criticisms, criticisms of this show was that most of the people coming on were Taekwondo practitioners because that's who I had around me at the time. Right. That's what, that, those were the people I was able to, to bring on. But just because they were of a Taekwondo background doesn't mean their stories weren't relevant or entertaining or inspiring to people who practiced other things. Absolutely. I, I am not a Christian, but you and I can still have this conversation and I can still find beauty in the way that you are talking about these two things that are very important to you. And I hope that others out there can can get that because unfortunately we live in a time right now where uh, everything is being thrown into these dichotomies and you're this or you're that. And if you're not on the same side of these fences or walls, then then you can't agree, you can't talk, you can't be friends. Yeah. And uh, if, if this was a different kind of show where I didn't censor foul language, I would go on about a 90 second tirade stringing experts <laughs> about how I feel on that. Right. Yeah. But it is, so I won't. Yeah. No, um, I appreciate that. And, you know, personally, we have chosen to run um, our martial arts school from a Christian perspective, but uh, we're very clear. I don't care if you're a Christian or not. You can join us. Like, we, we, we just, you just know that we are and that that's going to come up. Um, and I'm totally fine if, you know, if a new student uh, doesn't come from a Christian home, I don't care. They're here to do karate. Um, we're going to end up talking about God. And if that bothers them, I really, really hope that brings up a good open discussion, you know, and that, um, and that that's never something that separates us or, but, but if, if it is, um, you know, that that's, it's a loss. It's definitely a loss because we should be able to have those open conversations. And, you know, in regards to martial arts, too, you just mentioned most of the people you started out uh, speaking with in the early times were, were mostly Taekwondo practitioners because that's who you knew. Um, that's how I felt as a kid. And uh, I only knew karate. I only knew that martial arts was karate, you know, and I would go to tournaments and I would look at these other people doing soft forms, whether it was Kung Fu or Wing Chun or Tai Chi or whatever it was. And I would literally look at them and be like, wow, they're weird. We never do anything like that. You know, and the word weird popped up. And I heard a very, very wise friend tell me one time, never think something's weird. It's different. Find out why it's different and find out why you had that response. And then you're going to realize that you've just learned something that you needed to learn. And um, we carry that now into our school and at kind of our mid ranks, we start having our students uh, spread out and, and learn about other martial arts. Because I don't want them to only say, well, I learned karate, but I don't know about any of this other stuff. Um, you can learn something from, from anyone, right? I mean, in the martial arts context, I could send my kids over to a friend who runs a, uh, a Kung Fu school and say, they don't do things at all the way we do them but he is an incredible martial artist. If I sent you over there for a two hour class, you'd come back and you just come back and go, oh my goodness, I just learned so much or Taekwondo or fill in the blank. And so uh, that's definitely something that uh, in regards to martial arts, we don't want our students to have the experience that I had where you go to a tournament and you just go, what in the world are all these people doing? Um, but to be able to have a an, an, uh, discerning mind and be able to look around and go, oh, hey, I watched that on YouTube. That's really cool. I'm going to go talk to them about that. You know, 
um, I always say, I hope this is your first black belt. I don't hope it's your only one. I hope it's your first one. And I want you to come back and teach me what you learn in your next one. Because I'm getting old and my body's broken and I don't get to go out and learn a bunch more, you know, get a bunch more black belts. But uh, that doesn't mean I ever stop learning. Mm. It's a great attitude for it. One one more piece on what we were talking about, because I, I, I suspect there's a, there's a, not head scratching, but I, I can always sense mm-hmm. when people are saying, hey, Jeremy, poke on that a little bit. <laughs> um, I, I'm, ju- I'm just curious, you know, yeah. when, when you talk about this integration of, of faith and talking about God in your classes, yeah. what does that look like? And how have, I think this is the more important part, how have you considered and possibly changed how you've done that over the years? It's a great question. Um, so for foundation, uh, what I had was we open our class in prayer and the name of our school has the word Christian in it and that's it. Um, there is no more discussion about God. That's what I grew up, the school I grew up in. That was the extent of Christian. Um, when Gabe and I started talking about starting a school, um, and starting things out, um, you know, I talked to him and I said, hey, what was missing way back then was character training. Um, we were told, hey, don't make fun of people. Hey, be a good sport, you know, have good sportsmanship, um, have a good attitude, uh, whether you win or lose, all those things. We weren't told why. We weren't given any reasons. And um, over the years, as I've worked with kids a lot uh, here overseas, I love kids. And as I work with them, kids ask why. Um, especially when they don't want to do what you're expecting them to do. And I'm sure you've experienced that as, as an instructor. Um, yeah, but why do we do it that way? Yeah, why do I have to? Um, and I wanted to be able, in a respectful situation, in a respectful context, to answer them. And of course, my foundation, my reason for why in regards to those character traits is that the Bible is the core of what I believe. And so the Bible says, you treat people with respect. You, you love people. Treat them with kindness and integrity. You have integrity. You know, what does integrity mean? It means doing the right thing, even when no one is watching. Um, and, you know, so we've, we decided, okay, so we're going to have these core character traits that we talk about in class and that we expect from our students in regards to decorum in, in the dojo and at tournaments and in general. Um, and we want to give them the why, and that goes as deep as the student wants to go. Uh, with every rank test, with every uh, rank requirement, we have uh, scripture memory, and we ask them to, to memorize a couple of verses that have something specifically to do with what we're teaching. Um, and, you know, um, we had a, we had We've had a lot of discussions about what verses to choose. Um, and we, want, we wanted them to be very, very applicable. You know, one of the verses that we chose was from Proverbs. Um, and we have, our, we have our yellow belts learn it. Uh, and it just says, doing wrong is like a joke to a fool, but wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. That's a principle that I can use every single time that those kids are messing around and not listening and causing other kids not to listen or thinking it's funny to hurt somebody. Say, dude, come over here. What did we learn? Doing wrong is like a joke to who? To a fool. Do you want to be a fool? I don't want you to be a fool. I want you to be wise. Wisdom is pleasure to a man of understanding. That's what I want you to grow up to be. And so um, those are the things that we have chosen to really use as the as the core of um, how we do what we do. And um, and our students respond really well uh, because that gives them, you know, even if they don't care about the Bible, even if they're not Christians, that's still, that's a principle that that gives them. And and it's exciting, especially with the little ones to see them go, oh yeah, I chose to do the right thing because I memorized this and I remembered it and I did it 
and then to recognize that and to encourage that um it's it's very it's very profitable so that's what we do you know we uh um we obviously um we obviously spend a lot of time working on uh just martial arts skills but we try to weave in there uh, character training as well because from my point of view you can't be a good or even a great martial artist you just you can't be a great martial artist and have a rotten attitude or bad character in the sense that um you know i've seen some people with some great skills could care less about how other people feel um could care less about um who they leave in their wake as they move along in life and and uh that's not that's not a great martial artist You probably know I fully agree. Yes. That statement. Indeed. Yeah. That's great. It's, it's good stuff. I, I, I love hearing just the different ways people teach. And yeah. if someone's showing up and they're showing up again, then there's clearly value in what you're teaching and the way you're teaching it. And yeah, I, I, I dig it. I really do. I, I um, yeah. Awesome. Let's, Thanks. let's, let's move on from there. So, Story time. You know, I love everybody's stories. You know, we kind of heard your origin story there. Yeah. And I can't imagine that in your time teaching, especially children and training and the fact that you, you married someone who trains. Um, I can't imagine there isn't a pile of stories that we could go through. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed there is. <laughs> but if I, yeah. if I asked you for your favorite one to share, what would that be? Oh, man. Um, I think my favorite one, um, will be the time I spent and, and this is specific, it won't sound like it, but, um, just tying together, you know, I said earlier, uh, as I was sharing my, my origin story, that there was a purpose and there was a reason behind all this that I didn't see. Um, I just knew I was having fun. I knew that when I went to tournaments, a lot of the times I won. And when I lost, I learned a lot. Um, but fast forward, fast forward to being 17. I'm 17 years old. I am a brown belt. I'm as high as I can go without testing for black belt. And uh, I didn't get my black belt then. Um, and our dojo closed. We lost the lease. Uh, and my, my sensei moved away. He moved out of state. Everything just kind of fell apart. And uh, there I was actively training for my black belt test with no panel of black belts to test me. And that was, that was hard. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because leading into the story I want to tell, uh, that was important because, you know, of course, when you start karate, especially as a kid, you start any martial art. What's your goal? What's your first goal? To get your black belt, right? Um, and uh, that, was, that was my goal. And, um, so as I moved on in life, God took me to Russia. I went a lot of places in between 17 and 24, but when I was 24, um, I ended up in Russia, living in Russia in the last place on earth I thought I would end up. Um, but there I was small village living and working full time in an orphanage. And I just knew I wanted to love on kids. I got to go on a short-term trip. Um, I had no idea how to speak the language. I hated the food. I hated the culture. I hated everything about it, except for the fact that those kids stole my heart. And I just wanted, with everything in me, to go back and just love on them. And I knew I didn't have the language skills. I knew I didn't have a lot of the skills that I would need to successfully live there. But I just couldn't, I, I couldn't shake it. Like, this is what I was created to do. I just didn't know it until this moment, you know? And um, it was a beautiful thing. Uh, and so my best friend and I, she was my roommate in college, we ended up being able to go back there. And we got a visa for a year, which was remarkable. Um, almost impossible. But that's a whole nother story. We got a visa for a year, found ourselves living 
in this dorm building of this orphanage. And there were 100 and 120, between 120, 130 kids living in this building. And so if you've ever seen a movie with orphanages in it, this was, this was surreal. That's a lot of noise. That's a lot of people and um, a lot of chaos. Uh, and being there, I found out so much about why I learned martial arts. Um, I almost died several times. And my martial arts training is truly the thing that, the, the reason I'm here today. Um, and I can say that with 100% certainty, because as I look back on several experiences, I know that had I not known, hey, I can flip this guy and knock the wind out of him, take off the other direction. Um, had I not learned, be, being aware of your surroundings, just scope things out, have that martial artist mindset. Um, I absolutely know that I wouldn't be here today. And so that's a sobering thought and one I'm mm-hmm. just eternally grateful for. Um, and as I was in the orphanage, I had experiences that I think a lot of people haven't had. You know, I, I, I know we've all been in or seen scuffles between kids. These weren't like that. When these kids fought, nobody stopped them. And they had absolutely no reason not to kill the other kid. And even, then, even when they were small, they, were just, they would just go and fight and fight and fight. And you, I mean, sometimes it was to the point where I watched fights that I couldn't break up. Um, and sometimes they didn't stop until somebody broke a bone. And it was insane. That was something as an American kid, you just, growing up in a wonderful home, you, you, you aren't exposed to things like that. Um, and I know some people out there have probably experienced that type of lifestyle way more than I had. But there I was. Um, we had the most grievous to me and the thing that I used martial arts training the most for was uh, we had kids who would sexually assault other kids. And we were a big part of doing our best to stop that. And um, we had kids who tried to commit suicide. I experienced what it's like to tackle and disarm a knife from a kid who's desperately trying to kill himself before you can stop him. Uh, those, those memories are sobering. Um, and they stay with you forever. And, you know, it was after that night, I remember journaling. I remember sitting there and just talking to God and just, think, just thinking, am I going to have to do this again tomorrow? And the next day? And the next day? Because these kids have no hope. Um, this is real life. This is crazy. Um, and just being overwhelmed by that. And it was, it was that day that I said, you know what? I know exactly why I wanted to do martial arts. I know now because how in the world would I have known how to take that knife away from him without getting cut myself? You know, how would I have known how to, um, how to stop kids from attacking other kids? How would I have known, um, how to talk to the little kids about the very, very basics of how to defend themselves, how to be aware of their surroundings, look around, uh, what to look for, what to think about what to observe, you know, all of those things. Um, None of that. I wouldn't have had those skills. I wouldn't have had those assets. And I remember writing in my journal, um, I don't care about black belt anymore because I learned everything I needed for being here and being used by God to help make even the slightest difference. And that was when I went, this is why I learned martial arts. Whatever else happens in life, this is why. And it's worth it. And I'm so thankful. And, uh, and that was truly the moment when I just, I kind of let the, the dream of getting my black belt die. And I went, all right, I don't need that. I, I love what I've learned. I'm going to keep using what I've learned. And now I've just learned way, way more about self-defense than I ever would have dreamed in the dojo. So, um, I know that is a very tough and sobering story. Um, I could tell a lot of fun, happy ones, but that is a big part of what makes me who I am today as an instructor.
So, mm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's not much I can say to follow on to that. I mean, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm feeling a lot of emotion from what you said. As am I. <laughs> Yeah. I can hear that. And I, I appreciate your willingness to go there because I, I suspect there are people out there listening who have had maybe not the same type of story, but a similar response, a similar emotional response to things that have happened in and around their martial arts. Yeah. But hopefully most people haven't. Mm -hmm. And so your ability to share that reminds people that even if you are not the one, learning how to defend yourself because you need it maybe you're teaching someone who needs it absolutely and that is that is a perspective i take to class every single day is um you know statistics just st statistics alone tell us these kids are going to get attacked some of them uh in one way or another and our job is to do our very best uh, it's not a perfect world. We can't do a perfect job. And that's something that's really hard to uh, come to terms with sometimes. But we can do our utmost and our very best to make sure that they're prepared to be safe. Right on. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's flip it around. Let's, let's bring some, some smiles back. Sounds good to me. In here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we both need it. I'm guessing everybody listening does too. Indeed. I'm going to be a little selfish here. And normally I don't talk about aspects to people's lives and training that I know because the listeners don't, but I'm going to, because I can, because it's my show. <laughs> Indeed. Right. I, I, I've had the pleasure of getting to know your husband a bit. He's one of the people who helps with some of the content that we do here at Whistlecake. He's the one in charge of martial arts radio live for those of you that, that don't, that don't know. And I want to know more about you two, mm. because I know that your relationship and your faith and your martial arts bind you together. You know, I've had conversations with him that, that hinted at that. So I'm guessing that there's some, some good stuff in there. So why don't, you, why don't you tell us about Gabe? Yeah, absolutely. He's my favorite person to talk about, um, <laughs> besides the little people that we have together. Um, but uh, yeah, he is amazing. And I'm sure you've gotten to know that at least a little bit. Um, but uh, I, so I came back from Russia. They changed, politically, everything changed in Russia in 2008. And so I had to leave. I was there for almost four years. Um, but I came back, went back to college, uh, wanted to study more, learn more. Um, and I really wanted to study uh, counseling. So as as kind of an element to be able to, to help out with what I had already been working on. Um, and I met Gabe there and he had come in as a student as well. And he caught my eye um, mostly because every time I saw him, he was helping somebody. And, you know, I, I came in as a student. Most people come to college, uh, they're 18, they're 19, maybe 20. Uh, I was 26. I had just lived overseas. I had just lived a lot of hard years and good years but they were very hard and so you know I, I i wasn't into the whole run around and hang out and have fun at college kind of kind of scene i was there to work i was there to learn and then leave and go be serious again um that doesn't mean that i didn't have a lot of fun um just a little more sober than the average college student and one of the things that attracted me and to gabe was he was always working on something he was always doing something um something important at least that was my perception and uh we ended up we ended up really hitting it off we worked for the same after school company uh he was teaching guitar lessons and football and things and i was teaching introductory karate and uh we we got talking and it was one of those things where we sat down to talk for a few minutes uh small chat and 4 hours later after telling each other our life stories and realizing that, man, this is a neat guy. Um, we, we built a friendship and our friendship was just really fun. 
and very, um, very real. And I loved that about him that I could just sit and be myself. You know, I, I didn't, I'm not a very, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a very trying to look for the, the correct word. I'm a very simple girl. I put my hair in a ponytail, I throw on a hoodie, um, and I do martial arts, you know, um, and I'm kind of a take it or leave it kind of person. And I appreciated that he, um, he enjoyed hanging out with me and was just like, you know, um, attracted to that. And I was very attracted to him. And so, uh, yeah, six months after meeting, talking, getting to know each other, um, we started dating. And um, uh, a couple of weeks after that, we had picked out our wedding date. Uh, and that probably will make people laugh. Um, but we weren't, we were serious. Uh, and he was actually, it's kind of fun to tell people this, he was my first boyfriend ever. And um, I had a lot of guy friends. I had a lot of best friends that were guys. But I'd never really been interested in anybody. And so that was uh, actually surprising to me that our attraction grew so quickly and I was like yeah this guy's the one for me um and as we got closer um i started to see some things that i hadn't seen before uh little red flags in his character um and uh not to dishonor him in any way but I saw some anger flare up where it was in it was uh, not exactly a, a a just situation and that concerned me a little bit but not enough to, you know, really bring it up. But I prayed about that a lot. And um, after that, after, after our semester was over, I went and worked up in Alaska for the summer. And then we both had the incredible privilege of spending a semester studying in Israel. Um, that was an experience that it just, it's not something many people get to have to go spend 16 weeks in Israel studying. Uh, we, we got to go on hikes. We got to go see so many sites, biblical sites, everywhere. It was just incredible. Um, and Gabe was also uh, a part of that group. And so we were dating and we were overseas. It was his first experience being overseas. And I saw him go through some really intense things there. Uh, very, very intense culture shock. Um, he was a person who really liked to be in control of his life and obviously being in the Middle East and being overseas and <laughs> being uh, an international student, nothing's in your control. Everything changes every 20 minutes. And I had lived overseas for years and that's just kind of how it goes. And so I was kind of rolling with the punches as it were. Um, but that was really, really, really hard for him. And I remember hard hard conversations for weeks we would sit and we would talk for hours um again such a privilege that we could do that but he would just be like man i'm so out of control i'm so like internally i'm just a mess and you know you could see it on the external he thought he was hiding it i was like no we all we all know you're struggling man um and and i prayed for him and my roommate was just precious and she prayed for him a lot and we uh we had some really hard conversations and and one of the things that I'm just so thankful for was that trip because God really changed Gabe's life in Israel. Um, you know, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty clear that I'm a Christian and he had been raised in a Christian home. Um, but one of the things that he realized in Israel was he'd just been playing the game. Uh, he'd just been following the rules. Uh, nothing had changed in his heart. And um, nothing in regards to our relationship with God had really actually truly taken place. And that, that, uh, that trip was what it took for him to recognize that. And I saw his life completely change. Um, and I can't ex describe to you the 180 that I saw him do um, in Israel. And that was about halfway through our trip, a little over halfway through our trip that God just changed his life. And it was so beautiful. Um, and so it was with joy when he proposed to me uh, right before Christmas that year. 
And I said, absolutely. I am so excited to be your wife. I'm so, so excited to just be best friends forever. And um, we got married the following May in 2010, almost 10 years ago. Um, and it has been amazing to uh, just be married to my best friend. Uh, I had no idea how good marriage would be. I was perfectly content as single. And I think that was a gift as well. But this is, this is incredible. We have not had, we've not had it easy, but we've had each other. And um, we have three amazing kids and um, they are just a joy. And our family is just, man, what a gift. And, uh, you know, we, I, I, had, I had studied martial arts. He hadn't, he'd always wanted to. He did every other sport in the world. Um, and uh, so when I, yeah, it was about, about a year after we got married, um, I started teaching him a few things. I had taught him a little bit here and there. Um, here's a stance, here's a punch, here's, you know, how to do a front kick, things like that, but not formally, not, in, not intentionally. I started teaching him and uh, the church we were attending at the time, there's a bunch of kids there and I knew them, he didn't, but he was getting to know them. And, bunch of them were like, ah, oh, you should teach us karate. And, you know, before we knew it, we were in someone's basement with 25 kids. And so um, that was kind of our school's origin story. Um, just kind of started out. I was teaching Gabe and he was helping me teach them, even though he didn't know very much. And um, as he learned, uh, we had more and more in common. Uh, it was a struggle through different periods um, to be his wife. And to be his sensei, that is not a, an easy thing to kind of um, juggle both of those hats, you know, um, because in one moment I'm saying, hey, I want you to do this this way. And in the other moment, we're just sitting, having fun, hanging out as best friends. Um, and then, you know, back to being, okay, no, that's not right. You've got to fix this. You got to, you got to keep your hands up. You got to, whatever it is. Um, and so uh, he's gracious, but that was challenging and frustrating for us at different, particularly at different periods of, of training of, of the years. Um, and the fun part is uh, through those years, we have, we have resources as martial artists right now that I didn't have growing up. And I think that they are underrated, but highly valuable. We have the internet, we have YouTube, we have uh, countless uh, countless resources like whistle kick. You sit and listen to podcasts and you learn so much just from listening to an interview with somebody, you know, um, I didn't have those kind of resources. So Gabe has learned a ton, uh, as he's had time and as he has studied and I've continued to learn and we've brought that together and it's been really, really fun. Um, we had an experience that I never dreamed we'd have this past August when a panel of amazing black belts who have become our, uh, have become friends, dear friends, uh, they got together and they tested him for his black belt. So that's something I couldn't do um, on my own. And they tested me for uh, my second degree black belt. And we were able to test together. And that was just, that was incredible. So we have been just so blessed in martial arts and in our, our relationship. It continues to grow. And as we teach together, we complement each other really well. He's very, very exacting. He's very strict and yet fun. He's, um, I mean, I, I, would, I would be honest. I would, I would have to be honest and say our, our older, our more advanced students, they prefer learning under him because he is so uh, detail-oriented. He's so good at taking their uh small little inconsistencies and saying no 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 i see that this is what you need to fix this is what it needs to look like but also encouraging you know um and and for me i i would spend all day long with the little kids or with the brand new students just setting that foundation and so uh we both do both and we both complement each other really well and martial arts is just a way that thankfully i think could have driven a wedge between us. And, and I think it does for some people, but uh, it's just God's grace that it's brought us closer. 
you have advice for for people who might be challenged teaching their spouse? You know, were there were there things you figured out through trial and error that made that easier? I think knowing, you know, I think the um, the challenge. Yes, I think the biggest advice I could give is you know them much better than you're going to know a different student, really any student, even your own child, um, because kids are still developing. They're still growing. They still don't know their their abilities, their their skills. We we often help them discover those. Um, but when you're teaching somebody who they are an adult, they're very aware of what they can and cannot do. Um, and you know them so well, um, be very, my advice would be, be very, very careful with their heart. Yes, you're their sensei. Yes, you want them to do martial arts well, but don't lose sight of the fact that they are a person that you are, um, you're there to protect their heart. And so I balance balance it know when to say okay that's enough for today let's just go have coffee um you know that that's that's cool you practice for a while i'm not going to watch um you know know when to encourage and know when to uh know when to just say uh, i think i'm going to step back um call me if you need me and i think that keeping the relationship as the most important thing and martial arts below that is probably something that's going to sound counterproductive, especially if you really want to help them advance. But my advice would be to always keep that, keep those priorities in order. So. Makes sense. Let's look ahead. Let's talk about the future. What, what has you excited about the future? Everything. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> All right. Let's, let's narrow that down a, yes. a little bit. Yes. What, when when we talk about it from the context of, let's say, martial arts and training and yeah. and the things that are, you know, in and around what we've talked about today, mm. what are you excited about? I am excited about. I, I I get excited to go teach every day, so I'm excited about our school and its future. Um, and we just keep we just keep growing, and we don't advertise. Um, it's just kind of one of those things where, uh. We don't need to advertise. We uh, we don't have time to advertise. <laughs> so that has been a blessing. I know there are a lot of schools out there that are struggling, and so I am just I'm just grateful that currently that's not something we're th- we're even thinking about. Um, I am excited, extremely excited for our most advanced students who will soon be testing for brown belt. Um, looking ahead, I'm excited for when we have black belts in our system. Uh, because currently we we have Gabe and I, and that's it as black belts. Um, I'm excited to see uh, what what the future holds in regards to a tournament league that we're a part of. Um, it just got up and off the ground a couple of years ago, and we are working very hard to be as supportive as possible in as many ways as possible. Because we very much believe in the people that are uh, spearheading that, and also just in uh, quality competition. Um, and so we're excited to see what the future holds for that and what our role in that may be. Um, excited, to, um, excited to see my own kids come up through, through the program. Currently, they are extremely motivated and excited about it, and I love that. Um, but uh, yeah, for me personally, um, I. I was honored with the opportunity to test for Nidong, uh, for, for second degree black belt uh, this year. And in regards to my future aspirations of uh, rank, I could care less, truly. I know that sounds terrible, but I love what I'm doing so much that I, 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 don't, really, I don't really see myself doing it any better um, by having another rank. So that's not something I'm really focused on for myself. I am absolutely excited for Gabe to move up in rank and to outrank me someday. That has been a dream of mine for a long time because, frankly, just in regards to physical capabilities, he's way better than I've ever been. And uh, I have a lot of physical limitations, and that's okay. I can teach. 
and it's my passion. It's what I love. Um, so looking ahead, I'm, I'm looking ahead at uh, just getting better at teaching, continuing to hone our program down to where um, some things we might add, some things we might take away, just continuing to be able to adapt and make it as applicable and realistic as possible, um, continuing to learn uh, more and more about, you know, practical self-defense. And um, I'm, I'm looking very much forward to our students being able to go out in the world. And, you know, we've got a couple of them who said, I might go study Krav Maga next. I might go do jujitsu next. I'm, I might go do a really traditional um, hard style of karate, like Shotokan or something, and, and just learn what we haven't learned just because that's not what we do. Um, I'm excited for that. I'm excited for them to come back and maybe be better instructors than I've ever been. Um, so those are the things I'm, I'm looking ahead, I'm looking forward to. Uh, and right now, you know, um, in the day-to-day, -day, I, I look forward to every class. So. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great, great spirit. Now, if people want to find you or your school or, or any of that, you know, social media wise, email websites, you know, yeah. you got any of those? Yeah. We have a uh, Instagram for our school. Uh, it's just kicks karate school. Um, on Instagram, we, we currently don't have an open Facebook page that you could find. Uh, we may do that in the future soon. Um, but yeah, Instagram or email. If you want to email us kicks karate school at gmail.com. Um, and that's pretty much it. Easy. Yeah. Easy enough. Yeah. Well, this has been fun. This so uh, let's, let's, let's do the thing we do at the end. And why don't you give us some parting words? Um, parting words. All right. Um, you never know. Uh, you, you truly never know what sorts of situations you may need martial arts in. Even if you never get attacked, that may be because you learned martial arts. Um, there's so much you learn through sparring, through kata, through whatever you're doing. Uh, there are so many skills that you learn that you don't even realize you're learning. And that's the beauty of it. Um, being aware of your surroundings, being aware of your own abilities and inabilities and being able to, to pinpoint those. Um, you know, I have, I have students who have come back and said, I just knew something was wrong in fill in the blank, this situation. And so I didn't go there. And uh, I find that to be just as, just as valuable as a student who is physically attacked and able to get away safely. Um, absolutely. So um, I guess my parting words would be study hard and um, know that the more you apply and the more you learn and the more questions you ask, as long as they're asked from a true heart of wanting to learn and not just question everything, um, <laughs> the more valuable your martial arts experience is going to be. I had a lot of fun with this one. I've got a feeling you could tell. I enjoy all of my conversations, but the conversations that seem to bring me closer to the guests, people that I've enjoyed getting to know, people that I hope to continue to get to know, there's a special place in my heart for those, like today. So thank you, Sensei Siu, for coming on. Thank you for sharing your family with everything that we're doing here. And you know you've got my full support. If you want to check out the show notes, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Remember, episode 464, that's where you'll find all kinds of stuff. Every single episode we've ever done. And whistlekick.com is the place to go for everything else that we do. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 if you're looking for maybe a uniform or a shirt or some protective equipment or a hat. There's all kinds of stuff over there, and we're putting out new stuff all the time. There are a number of other ways you can support us beyond purchases. You can share an episode. You can leave us a review on Google, Facebook. You can follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere. Or you can contribute to the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you spend $5 or more per month, you're going to get more content. Yes, more. I am committed to giving you more all the time. If you've got a suggestion for a guest, reach out. And if you want to email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 